Sounds good. Bless you, Jesus. <laughs> Verse 9. Joshua said to the Israelites, hey, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know the living God is among you and that he will certainly take care of all the bad guys. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, each one of the tribe. And as soon as the priest who carried the Ark of the Lord of all the earth, Remember, we're giving context to who this is. This isn't no little deity. This isn't no abusive father. This isn't the guy that helped you and walked out on you. No, the one that created all, is all, sustains all. This is the great I am. He's with you. He's with us. And he's about to do something marvelous. But the question is, are you looking? Imagine for the, imagine about the guy that was in like the back tent. He doesn't really want to be a part of community. You know, I'm living my own life. I'm out here hustling. And so he has like his tent out on the edge. And so he takes a nap because he's tired. And then, and then he calls like, hey, everybody, we need to gather together because I got big news from God. But because he was living in isolation, he missed the instructions of abundant blessing. Some of us get mad at God because we're not being blessed. My question is, are you close enough to the camp to hear the instructions? Are you actually paying attention? Are you actually leaning in saying, okay, God, like what's next for our church and for me? Like not just for me and my little tent, but like for us as a community. Like the Bible wasn't written to an individual. It was written for a group of people. But a lot of times what we do is we go to the New Testament and we go, man, I just want to get this in my soul and live it out and become the fullness of who I can be. And I, listen, I admire that. I think that's great. But can I tell you, 90% of the Bible, you can't live out by yourself. You can't forgive somebody till you've been abused by somebody. You can't take care of the bitterness in your heart if there hasn't been a past. You can't be generous if there's no one to be generous to. And we have a lot of Christians that try to live in isolation and find fulfillment. But God says, no, nah, you're a part of the body. You're not just the awkward pinky toe that was chopped off and thrown away. You're not going to thrive by yourself, but you have to be in community. And what I love is when we get in community, we start seeing God move in incredible ways. Because what happens was when the people broke camp, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. And watch this, verse 15. Now, the Jordan, this is why we know it was crazy. It was at harvest time. We already talked about this. It would have been 10 feet deep, 20 plus feet wide. I mean, it would have just been insane. Massive water coming down. It would have sweeped you away if you stepped in the middle of it. And so, now the Jordan is at flood stage. Yet, as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet, their tippy toes, touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing and it piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. Everybody say Adam. Amen. Write that down. You're going to need it in a few moments. In the vicinity of Zarathan. Everybody say Zarathan. While the water flowing down from the sea ended up going all the way back to the Dead Sea that was ahead of them. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho. And the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord, stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, stood on a firm foundation where the water used to be, where it was muddy, where it was soaked. They were standing on dry ground. And while that took place, all of the people that were the best Christians of the day passed over. All of the people that were from a certain heritage passed over. All the people that believed a certain way, that acted a certain way, all the people that tithed, that served on Dream Team, they had passed over. No, what does it say? It says all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Let me say this. There's some of you that are a part of this church and you're getting a blessing upon your life just because you're a part of this church. It's something called overflow. We love to sing about it. We love to pray for it, but a lot of times we don't understand it. That's why some of you, and I'm going to lean in as a friend today, but I'm going to pastor a little bit. Some of you are in some deep wretches of sin, and you think that the blessing that God is still giving you is because God's not that bothered by it. No, 
The reason you're getting the blessing is because this community is covering you. See, that's the thing about sheep. When they're chilling with the shepherd in the flock, they may be a little messed up, but if they're in the middle of the flock, they're still protected from the wolves that are around. But the problem is when you step out of community, you get the fulfillment of what you do. So some of you need to start saying thank you more to the people around you. Thank you for praying for me because I don't pray for myself. (laughs) Thank you for reading the Bible because I don't read it, but I always come to you and talk about it. Some of you need to just say thank you. Buy him a coffee. Do something. Because when you're in community, there will be a natural overflow of blessing. But what's amazing about that is when you go, wait a second, I don't just want to be a bystander anymore. I don't just want to attend, but I want to participate. You go from receiving the overflow to being a conduit, a passage point for the overflow. Think about that. You go from just receiving in life to now being abundantly generous in life. And so Joshua goes on this radical journey of seeing delivery and breakthrough take place. Now, for all of us today, I really want to give some modern context to this story because if you're like me, you've been in Sunday school, you've heard the sermons, like we've gone through this a thousand times. I know they walk across the Jordan, so great. They get to Jericho, they walk around Jericho. But I just want to pause for a moment and give some context to what's happening. But before I do that, let me ask you this question. How are you when it comes to keeping promises? Like on a scale of one to five, where are you at in keeping promises? Like you don't have to put them up and maybe show me if you're like a two, a five. Okay, some of you are three. Some of you are honest, a big zero. I appreciate your honesty. You're like, don't ask me to do anything, all right? I appreciate that. I didn't point you out. That wasn't you, mama. I was just saying in general. (laughs) Woo, put them down. So, So I really try to keep my promises like I really do. But I'm not perfect at all. Like, I don't claim to be that. But what's funny is in this season, I'm learning to keep promises and do what I say like no other. And the reason why is because Zion the lion is watching. My two-year-old son, who's turning three this week, by the way, shout out. We're going to Disney on eyes. Let's go. So excited. So he's super smart and aware. And he knows what daddy is saying. But he also knows what daddy is doing. So, like, he'll ask me questions all the time, and he'll be like, do you promise? I'm like, I promise. Cutest thing, you know? Well, and my boy loves cookies. We go by Publix. He's like, cookie? And I'm like, yeah, we should go get free cookies. Like, I literally go to Publix just to get free cookies. And the one in Miami Gardens, they treat me like Zion, so I get a free cookie, too. I love it. It's a blessing. It's just an anointing on my life, guys. You tithe, you can get free cookies in your life, okay? So, anyways, so the other day, though, we're at the park, and something that Zion likes to do is cook food. Um, I married Jacqueline, um, something you don't know about Pastor Doug, who's a part of this community, him and Susan, the missionaries. They're half Italian, half Romanian, so, like, food is just flowing in our house. Like, come on, somebody. So, we, like, are teaching Zion to cook right now. He loves it. And one of his favorite things in the world, we don't cook, but actually Checkers gives us, and that's French fries. So he loves fries. Um, So we're at the park, and he decided he wanted to play cooking, and it was so great. He's at his little thing. He's like, hello. He's like, what you want? And I was like, I would love some fries. He's like, okay. And so he turns around, and he said, I'll be right back. And he like runs away, and I'm like, where's he going? And he comes back, and he brings me a big old leaf. And it's got mud in it, a little bit of a bug. And he's like, here you go, fries. And I was like, oh, thank you. I was like, you know, pretending to eat it. I was like, oh, this is so good. Thank you. You're a great cook. And he's like, no. And I was like, what? No, this is a good fry. He's like, no, you eat for real. (laughs) I was like, like, daddy is eating. No, you eat for real. (laughs) I was like, okay, son. Ah, no, I'm just kidding. I didn't eat that. We had a lesson right there. We're like, we do not eat leaves in this house. <laughs> Showing up to elementary school, got some bugs and sticks out of your mouth. We don't look good as a unit then, you know? So, like, I had to tell him. I was like, no, we're pretending. Like, daddy is eating it, but he's, like, eating it like this, you know? Like, there it is. <laughs> and he was like, okay, you liar. You know, like, he didn't believe it. <laughs> and what I think happens is most people believe God is like me eating the fake french fries. Like, listen, God, you said you're going to promise me this. You're going to do it. And then we get it, and it's like, I don't, do you know what you're doing? And it's like God's eating the fake leaf. He's like, I said I'd bless your finances. Mwah, mwah, look at that. And you're like, I guess you kind of did, but okay. Like, 
I'm glad I got a paycheck this month, but rent's due every month, God. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, you're going to work in my relationships. Like, I'm glad me and my wife are working on stuff. We had a good date night, but then, like, life happened again, and I guess I need to be content. And so what happens is most people think that their promise from God kind of comes with a whole lot of, well, kind of, sort of, there's some leaves and some bugs, but you'll get the majority of it. And that we're supposed to just take it and go, okay, thanks, good father. I'll take my nasty leaf blessing. The best is yet to come. (laughs) But friend, can I tell you, that's not how God operates. His promises are yes and amen, meaning yes and let it be. The thing about God, though, he operates on a different timeline. And that doesn't mean it's delayed. It actually means it's destiny. See, some of us go, I think God's delayed in this promise. No, no, no. He's marked destiny upon this promise. See, think about, think about the people of Israel. Do you remember who got promised the promised land? For all you Bible nerds out there, it was a guy, Father Abraham had many sons. Okay, we know the story. He got promised that they were going to see the promised land. But the promise didn't happen until 500 years later. So was God late in his promise or did he actually have a bigger blessing than Abraham could understand? Some of you, God has promised something in your life, but honestly, you're too finite with it. You're thinking God's going to take care of your finances, but he's actually going to bless your children and your children's children. Like he's building a dynasty through you. But you're just hoping that you can just get through the week. He's like, no, no, I'm changing your mindset so that you can thrive for decades to come. Like, we have to understand that God's functioning at a higher level. But what happens is we hear that it sounds good. We say, amen, preach, pastor. But then we have to go out and, like, live in the delay. Like, I have stuff I'm praying for my life. I have stuff that's been said about this church and about us as a community. And I'm like, God, (laughs) I'm not seeing it. Like, I've heard some crazy things. Are you, are you sure that was you? And he's like, yeah, that was me. And I was like, oh, well, uh, okay, can I know a little bit more? Well, not yet. Oh, well, don't you love when God says not yet in your life? <laughs> but what I love in the not yet moments, it's an invitation not to go away, but to come a little bit closer. Because Abraham's promise, while it was set for him, it was so much bigger than him. Think about the promise overflow. It was given to one man, but it overflowed into 2.5 million people and then became the inheritance of Christ that we still have today. So the thing I think that we need to understand when it comes to this story is how to function at a higher level of thinking, but seeing God in the delay of the details. And what I love about how this lays out is I'm just going to make it simple today. I actually have one point. That's it. It's going to be at the end of the message. But we have to go through this whole narrative story story to really grasp the understanding of it. And I think the first thing that we have to understand, I talked about it last week when it came to the Moses, Joshua being like Moses. We'll jump into it. It's in verse 7. It says, the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in eyes of all the people. And they will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. So here's my question. When you think about Moses, do you think about the guy that did all the signs, all the wonders, led the people out of Egypt? Or do you think about the guy that died in the wilderness because he couldn't keep it up? Because how you think about Moses is also how you think about you. When you look at your life, do you see the possibilities Or do you see your deficiencies? When you look at your future, do you think the best is yet to come? Or I'm just a bum? How do you process your life? For many of us, we live in the mindset of a gap. See, the gap versus game mindset, it's so incredible. If you want a great book, you can read Gap versus Game by Dr. Benjamin Hardy. But it works like this. All of us have dreams, passions, and admirations in our life. And we aspire to move to something great. But the problem about the goal in front of you is you never fully arrive to it because it's like the sunset. It's calling you forward into something beautiful, but you're never able to grasp it. 
And when you're constantly looking ahead at where you need to go, the, all you begin to see over time is how far you need to make it and how short you're coming up. But can I tell you, you're not supposed to measure your life on your goals someday. But you're supposed to measure your life on the progress that you've already made. Because what happens is when you measure off some someday reality, you're measuring off of something that's ethereal. You can't judge it. You can't think about it. You can't process it and weigh it. All it can do is make you emotionally feel something. And while it's good to encourage us forward, we need to look back and go, wow, look how far I've come. Some of you are so upset because you're still addicted to the bottle every night. Well, let me encourage you. You used to be addicted day and night. You're halfway there. Some of you talking to the burning bush every weekend. And I ain't talking about Moses. But let me encourage you. You ain't lighting up on 95 anymore. You're making progress. Some of you are tithing 2%, calling it tithing. All right, it ain't 10, but it's better than it used to be. Listen, we need to be people that see where we want to go, but celebrate what God has done. So can we just get a little rowdy and celebrate what God has done in our life? Can you thank him for your story? Can you thank him for what he's already done? Because the past is what propels you into the future. Your faith for what was is what fuels you into what's going to be. Think about it. Some of you have miracles in your history timeline that you fasted and prayed and wept over. And now you're like, I'm good. Like, thank you, God. But God, remember, he's not limited in a timeline, meaning he is everywhere all at once, past, present, and future, meaning he's still working and providing the miracle even though you already forgot about it. Like, you're looking at your past. You're like, God, I'm good. Thanks for doing that. And he's like, no, I'm still here holding it because I care about you. I'm still here taking care of that depression that you got over because I love you. I'm still here holding that anxiety, that broken relationship so that you can move on. Go on, my son. Be free. Carry this no more because your daddy has it. See, the reason it doesn't go with you is because he took it with him. Man, I am preaching better than you saying amen right now. Okay, listen, because you've got to get this. The trauma that doesn't live with you today is because it's on the cross of Calvary and has been buried in the ground. And it's because Jesus poured out his blood. He gave his life. He's still holding it. And the same Jesus that did that is the same Jesus in this moment right now with Joshua saying, let's step out into the middle of the chaos. Here's my question. What's the chaos in your life? What's the thing keeping you up at night? You're like, I pray to God he never asked me to go there. Don't ever ask me to talk to Patricia, Lord. I will punch her in the face. Don't ever ask me to build a relationship with Kevin or start that business. God, I can't do it. Don't ever ask me to deal with these skeletons. Ah, I don't like them. I'd rather just buy a bigger closet and throw the rest of them in there. I don't want to mess with it. But God's saying, no, no, no. That's exactly where I want you to go. See, think about this. This is, this is the funniest thing. Okay, so God promised Abraham the promised land. And in all of his great wisdom, in all of his might, all of his power, Joshua steps into authority and he waits until the worst time in the entire world for the miracle to happen. And he goes, okay, Joshua, you excited to lead? He's like, I sure am, God. I'm 80 years now, 80 years old now, been waiting for 40 years. Moses just died, and okay, here we go. What do you want to do first? He's like, I want you to go into the middle of the chaos right now. And he's like, oh, God, it's harvest season. Uh, that means this is not a good time. So how about we try again later? He's like, no, no, no. It's the perfect time for me to display my glory. God, it's not convenient because I can't do anything to help. Exactly. It's the perfect time to display my glory. God, it doesn't make sense because everything's crazy. I got crazy with a side of crazy and I'm a little crazy. It's the perfect time for me to display my glory. Listen, I haven't been on this, this planet too long, but I've gone through enough in my life that when crazy begins to break out, <laughs> I just know God's about to do something. <laughs> like, I just know that when I feel the pressures of every day coming in, that it's in that moment, God's probably about to move. Like, me and Jacqueline, we literally talk about this all the time. We'll begin to feel the pressure in our home. Stuff begins to go sideways. And we look at each other, and we're like, God's about to do something. <laughs> and can I tell you, every single time, he has done it and come through. God is calling you. 
to step into the chaos. He's calling you to go to the edge. But the question is, are you going to put your tiptoe in the water? Because he told the priest, listen, I need you to pick up the Ark of the Covenant. I need you to carry it into the Jordan River. And when you do, it will make a miracle, but only when you get in. Can, can you just imagine for a second what it was like for the priest? They're picking up the Ark of the Covenant, weighing 300 pounds. They're walking into the roaring Jordan River. There's 2.5 million people just watching them. They're like, they're about to die. Look at that. They're going to die with the presence of God. Okay, like, okay. And they're walking in, and they're like, hey, okay, here we go. <laughs> God's going to come through. Okay. <laughs> you did sacrifice that lamb yes, last night. In case we go to hell, like we're covered. Okay, good. We did do that. Okay, here we go. Oh, I knew it happened. <laughs> it like parts all of a sudden, like, oh, we good. We out here. God's faithful. <laughs> Don't you love how we do that? We step out terrified. The miracle happens. Like, I knew it. I was fasting. I was praying. Like, I'm the pastor now of my life. You know, like we get all this courage. But can I tell you, you don't have to be insecure in the chaos. You can be secure even when you're afraid. That's part of stepping out. It's not when God calls you to something, you're like, oh, I'm not scared anymore. <laughs> Must be God. No, you go, I'm terrified out of my mind. And God's like, come on. Some of you are thinking about starting a business, and you're like, well, when I'm brave enough to leave my nine to five, then I will. Listen, no, you won't get brave enough. You'll get brave enough in the breakthrough, but God already spoke it. And if he gave you vision for it, like last week, he gives you provision for it. That's what he does. So he calls him out into the chaos. But here's the thing I need you to see. Your life is like this Coke can. It's great. It's fantastic. And God has so much inside of you. And what happens is when God begins to speak to you, he begins to shake you up a little bit. He begins to have a way like, I can't be here anymore. I got to move. I got to do something. You begin to get a little hungry. And then you get around people like Pastor Gary begin to encourage you. And you're like, ooh, Pastor Gary with that flower shirt speaking words of faith over my life. Come on, somebody. And he begins to have that happen. And then you get around people like Damien that just make you feel good about yourself. I've never had someone encourage me about my buck teeth like Damien before. I felt so loved. He talked to me about my gap, and I was like, man, that's good. Like, gap versus game right here. Like, I felt so good. I'm telling you. Now, obviously, I'm being silly, but God begins to speak to you. You feel this encouragement, and God's like, all right, you ready? You're like, God, I'm ready. Let's do this. There's so much inside of me. And he's like, okay, I'm calling you to do this. And you go, I'm good. Like, I'm good. And then he comes back and he's like, all right, listen, I've encouraged you. You've been praying. You've been fasting. I know what you want. You've been talking. Like, we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is your time. I'm good. Can I tell you something? The can has all the potential to blow up. But if it isn't cracked open, ain't nothing going to happen. Some of you are sitting with all the potential, with the Spirit of God shaking you up, calling you to greatness, but you will not open yourself up to what he's calling you to do. So what's going to happen is you're going to sit on the edge your whole life and watch people live out the very thing you were called to do. May we be a people that's open to God. May we be a people that say, I'm going to step into the chaos when it doesn't make sense. And may we be willing to experience what he has. Because what happens is the moment we do that and we carry the presence of God, everything begins to change in our situation. Chad, you can go ahead and head up here. So the priests went into the Jordan River, okay? And they're carrying the Ark of the God. And the Ark represented the presence of God. Here's my question again for all of us today. What are you carrying around in your life? Because what you're carrying is defining you. Are you carrying your shame from the past? Are you carrying your anger? Are you carrying your doubt? Or are you carrying the spirit of Jesus? The ark literally was a representation of Jesus Christ, his presence, leading the people of God. But here's what I want you to see. The moment the presence of God stepped into the Jordan, everything changed. And it didn't just change in a historical context. It changed in a spiritual context, too. 
Let me teach you real quick. When you go to the Bible, we need to make sure that when we read the Bible, we're not reading it as 21st century Western people. But we need to read it in the Jewish context it was written. And when the people of the Jewish heritage would read the Bible, they didn't just see historically what happened, but there was what they called a mysticism that was under the text. We know that today as the Holy Spirit speaking through the text. So what I want to do is read in verse 15, and I want to show you what happens when they walk into the Jordan. It was the harvest season. The Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above the point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed into the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. And then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. It's so good, Lord, help me to teach it. So the people had had a water miracle before. Remember, walked into the Red Sea. It was parted completely, wall on both sides. You saw the Prince of Egypt. You saw the well go by. It was a really cool moment. But what happens in this moment, the moment they walk into the Jordan River, it says that it goes all the way back to a city called Adam. Where have we heard about Adam before in the Bible? Remember at the very beginning of the story? And that Adam, what did he do? He sinned. And it brought sin into the world. But scripture says, what was there? A new Adam. A new Adam. And when the new Adam steps into the Jordan River, when the new Adam stepped into the chaos of sin and death and shame, it got pushed all the way back to the first Adam. Meaning that it no longer can mess with you meaning that it no longer can overtake your life. But it's been pushed back to the very beginning. And why did this take place? It's because of the second town called Zarethan, which means piercing. Because he was pierced for our transgressions. He was punishment, punished for our sins. And it was our burden, our death, that was upon him. And what does it say? By his wounds, we are healed. Do you see the power of the story right here? The moment Jesus steps in the situation, sin is no longer a roaring river that can overtake your life. And not only is it not a roaring river, notice this. What were they standing on, muddy ground? No, they were standing on dry ground. The evidence of the Jordan was no longer there. The evidence of your sin no longer stains you. The evidence of your shame isn't allowed to be a part of you. You are clean, you are free, and made new. This is what Jesus does. This is who he is. This is the gospel. And this is what he desires to do in your life. But the reality is for the priests... They were in a moment that honestly would have been hard to understand that. Not because they didn't have the full revelation of Jesus, but also they're in the middle of a miracle. See, we read the story and it's like, oh, the people passed over the Jordan. That's really good for them. Well, there was 2.5 million people. So if you were to have one person cross over every single day, literally for 24 hours, it would have taken a minimum of 29 days for the people to get across. And God said, we read the whole verse, that's why I gave context, that they had to hold the Ark of the Covenant the whole time the people were crossing. So for 29 days, the priests are there rotating shifts, holding the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of what could have been their death. And I don't know about you. I bet you got tons of faith. You don't walk through and have problems. But if I'm sitting there holding the Ark, I'm not going to be watching the people going, oh, look at them go. I'm going to be watching and be like, is it coming? Is it coming? Like, is the river coming? I think that's the river. Is that a shadow? Is that a goat? Like, is that, what is that? Like, I'm, I'm going to be terrified. And I'm going to look at the people next to me, and I'm like, what are we going to do? Like, what's going to happen? Here's my question. How are you doing with what you're holding right now? Because some of you are holding, you're like, listen, I'm glad I'm in the middle of a miracle. I'm holding my marriage, but I don't know if I can hold this anymore. Like, I'm glad for this promotion, this new job. I don't know if I can take this leadership anymore. I'm glad for this concept, for this startup business. I don't know if I can hold this anymore. Listen, can I tell you, if you've given your life to Jesus, 
You don't have to hold it anymore. You can just let him hold you. You can just let him hold you. And how do you hold on to Jesus? You just hold on to Jesus. Because as long as the people were holding on to the ark, the miracle took place. As long as they took hold and held on to his presence and who he was, the miracle was going to happen. I told you I have one point. Here it is. Write it down. Get it in your soul. Hold fast to Jesus, and it will all be okay. Hold fast to Jesus, and it will all be okay. Hold fast to Jesus, your finances, your family, your fatigue, your energy, your hope, your joy. It will all be okay. Just got to hold on to Jesus. But sometimes holding on to Jesus is hard because it costs something. Because we don't understand the fullness of it. Because we begin to wonder, how is God working in this finite situation? But can I tell you, when you seek first the kingdom of God, all things will be added for you. When you seek first holding on to him and getting close to him, everything else gets taken care of. But can I tell you, this is what a lot of Western people do. They go, okay, hold on to the presence. I better read more, study more, pray more, fast more, do, do, do. No, no, no. God's not asking you to do more, my friend. He's just asking you to be who you are with him. He just wants to spend time with you. He just wants to talk to you. Well, I don't know the Bible enough to know Jesus. Don't worry about it. He made you. He'll, he'll show you who he is. All you got to do is invite him to be a part of your day. Wake up in the morning, have coffee. Hey, God, I'm drinking coffee. What do you want to do? And realize God's not shaming you. He's not walking around angry at you. But he's saying, my child, I love you. I've got so much for you. I had this random kid post a uh, comment on my this Instagram reel I had, and we've been going back and forth just talking. And he's like, listen, I grew up in the church. Like, I really love God. But he's like, God doesn't love me. I don't understand. I always fail him. I know he's going to be mad. I don't know how to hear his voice. I don't know what to do. It was just this long paragraph. And I was like, bro, you just need to understand grace in your life. Like, we just need to understand grace. And as I've been in this promised land series, I've been talking about what we need to do. But can I tell you, all of that is only built on grace. You need to understand God loves you. He sees you. And he's got good things for you. And the good things you find is simply when you just desire him. So how do you desire Jesus? You just give recklessly to him. And it's not reckless in a spiritual sense. It's just reckless in a worldly sense. You just go, Jesus, I just want to give you everything. See, one of the reasons I love coming every single Sunday is because of the worship team that we have on stage. Can we give it up for the worship team? Just one more time. Like, like y'all don't even know the amount of time, hours, and energy they put in. They come to rehearsals. They're always talking and working together, like so many different things. They've been in here five, six, seven, eight times. The power has gone out. It's been completely black. They still have to clean up everything. Like, literally, this is who they are. But what I love about this worship team, thank you, Miss Andrea. The new place has AC. I'm very excited about it, which is really cool. So something I love about this team is the hearts that they have for worship. See, this is what I love about them. They have hearts that love Jesus. And they just want you to experience Jesus. Like, they're not worried about the show. They're not worried about the voices, the sound. Obviously, we want to look good. Like, we work on that. We want to sound good. Yeah, but they just love Jesus. And when I first moved to Miami, I had some people come and talk to me. And they were like, listen. They were like, if you want a really good worship team, what you need to do is pay your musicians. Because, like, you have some of the best people. They'll be coming out of the woodwork. Like, they'll be showing up. Like, it's going to be good. And I was like, listen, my friend, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't want broken vessels on stage. I want people that got a heart. I want people that are fasting and praying for the community. I want people that are doing whatever it takes. I want people that are stepping out, saying, I got to be a part. So when I come on Sundays... I love seeing this team because they're setting the example. They're saying this is what it looks like to magnify and glorify the Lord in unseen spaces so that he can be known in seen spaces. And I also love it because every single Sunday, I get to see Chad do what Chad does. And if you don't know Pastor Chad, 
He's just like the bubbly guy with a beard that walks on his tiptoes. Like, great guy. But the thing about Chad, whew, the thing about Chad is Chad from the beginning of his life has been desperate for Jesus. Now, being my brother-in-law, we get to do life together. I know his story. But what's so amazing is before he came to Collab, he was working in the engineer world. He's building power lines and helping us get light bulbs and hurricanes would happen. He shows up with a team, but he wasn't just doing it. He was leading massive amounts of teams, 40, 60 full unit teams of people all around the nation. And he was on pace to be the youngest executive in his company, making good money, having a comfortable life, having the American dream. But he said, God, I don't want my dream unless it's your dream. So he said, I'm going to begin to embrace the Jordan River of my life and go, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And then he went on this radical journey of God calling him here to Collab Church, leaving North Carolina, Elevation Church, his job and everything. And then he showed up here and his job became portable. He was working in his apartment. Nine to five, he's doing that. And then on the weekends, he's doing all this time. He's getting the team ready. He's serving. And then the day came where he was allowed to come and be on staff. And let me tell you, it took a massive pay cut because we ain't paying like engineers, all right? (laughs) But it didn't matter because he said, I just choose Jesus. And I just want to be where he's at. And the reason I share that story is because God is asking you to do the same. Not for you to quit your job and join the staff of Collab Church, but for you to quit living at a lesser life than you were called to. When we get desperate for Jesus, all things become added to us. When we just say, I want your presence and nothing more, I just want to hold on to you, I just want to be with you, everything changes. And church, where we're going is going to require that. There's moments that's going to feel like the Jordan River where we're in the middle wondering, is this going to work out? Is God going to do this? It's going to feel like that in your personal life. But can I tell you, if you will just hold on to the presence of Jesus, he'll come through every single time. I was sitting back there with Miss Heisen before service. Love you. She's always so encouraging before I get up there. She's like, I'm always praying for you. I was like, thank God I need it. And if you've been on this journey with Collab Church, it's, it's so beautiful in all its facets. Me and Jacqueline moved here in 2019, started Collab on Zoom with no one, and then went on this radical journey of mergers and collaboration and so many God moments. But all before this took place, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Luke that came into the building. And he legitimately serves in the office of prophet. If you don't know what that means, it means God speaks to him very directly about communities and groups and where they need to move in life and what God's doing. And he said very clearly that the church was being called into a season of going out on the water. And he said, your ships that are full of precious cargo. And he said, you're going to meet at one location for one moment, but then you're going to meet at another and you're going to be in transition. And he said, and in this transition, I'm going to begin to give new structure, new organization. I'm going to give you a heart for evangelism. I'm going to give you a heart for the lost. But then he said this. He said, and what's going to happen? There's going to be a new day when fresh blood is going to come into this house. It's not going to be sheep that were mad at their church, but it's going to be people that don't know who Jesus is, giving their life to Jesus and being transformed. And he said, and when all that is taking place, One day you'll find a physical building. But he said, you're not going to get to the location until I give you what you need. And church, can I tell you, we're stepping into a new season, and we're going to see that begin to take place. We're going to see the lost become found. We're going to see broken become whole. We're going to see restoration take place. God is doing a new thing, and we get to be a part of it. And so over the last few weeks, I know I've been yelling. I know I've been excited. I've obviously been sweating all of this. But the reason why is because I want you to realize what you're a part of. I don't want you to miss the miracle. I don't want you to be the Coke can on the counter wondering, when will I get to be a part of something great? But I want you to be in the middle of what God is doing. 
So may we be a church and a people that are desperate for the presence of Jesus. And may we live it out in every capacity of our life. And as we do, may we see the Jordan River get pushed back and miracle after miracle come through.